Hi, welcome to apps, add-ins, and more with AppScript. If you can say that three times fast, I'll give you a cookie. I'm Corey. I'll be presenting this. I'm an engineer in Google AppScript. I'll be presenting along with Drew, who's also an AppScript engineer, and James Ferreira, who's one of our users. Uh, before we begin, here are some important links. If you'd like to tweet about the conference, or even buzz, um, IO 2011 for the conference, Google Apps for the track, and if you'd like to give us feedback, there's a short link up there. Please go ahead and use it. OK, so let's begin. Can I get a show of hands? Uh, has anyone in the audience used Google Apps Script? Not bad, not bad. Those of you at home on YouTube, you can also raise your hands if you like. We won't be watching, but it makes you feel part of the I.O. experience. So let's define some terms. An add-in, an app, an app script. Well, an add-in is an extension to Google Apps that provides integrated glue logic. Think of it as a plugin, adding functionality to an existing Google app. An app, on the other hand, is a full-scale application with its own user interface at its own URL that interacts with the rest of the Google Apps suite. An app script is Google's, is Google's cloud scripting language, which lets you build both add-ins and apps that live entirely in the cloud and participate in the Google Apps suite. This is Bob. Those of you who came to our I.O. session last year may remember Bob as the guy who automated everything at Acme Corp. Well, Bob no longer works for Acme Corp. Don't worry, he wasn't fired. In fact, he did so well that he retired. Then the housing bubble came, and all of Bob's friends were losing their homes. So Bob sprang into action as a second career, helping his friends refinance their mortgages. Sure, why not? The problem is that this is pretty labor intensive, and Bob is a, is a guy who doesn't like to do a lot of labor. So today, we're going to help Bob build a mortgage calculator. It's going to automate a lot of his workflow process. This is going to involve a lot of pieces, from debugging to GUIs, the, how to deploy an app, using Gmail, writing documents, things like blobs and conversions that will become clearer as we go through them. So let's step through it one piece at a time. Here's the app we want to build today. This is Bob's calculator. On the top left is a panel showing emails from Bob's Gmail account that have something to do with refinancing a mortgage. Below that is a panel showing the most recent, I'm sorry, the currently selected email. And on the top right is a mortgage calculator where Bob can fill in the amount, the rate, and the years, or even have it, or even have it auto populated from an email. On the bottom is a button that says generate reply with quote. When Bob clicks that button, the person who got the email gets back from him a quote for a new mortgage. Looks pretty cool. How do we build it? Well, the first thing we need is to talk about the basics of a mortgage calculation app and how to debug it. This is a calculate monthly payment function. You take in the principal, the amount of money, the rate, and the number of years, the term of the loan, and it gives you back the expected monthly payment. And I'm not going to lie, I took this directly from Wikipedia. Now, if you test this, according to Wikipedia, with $100,000, a 4.0 rate, and 30-year mortgage, you should get a $477 monthly payment. So let's see what happens. We run the function, take a look at the logs, and that is not the value that Wikipedia told us would be there. Something's wrong. Well, luckily for us, this year, Google Apps Script launched a debugger. We can set a breakpoint and start debugging and see what's going on in every line of code. Like any other debugger, we have step into, step over, and step out. And here we're using step into to step through the code line by line, see the values changing in the bottom panel as the code executes. That looks good. That looks good. Still looking good. And the denominator is clearly wrong on the bottom. OK. Oh, we can fix that. Let's get out of debugging mode. Ah, there it is. As with everything else, a, mi a misplaced parentheses is the problem with our program. OK, so we can fix it. Run it again. And there it is, the value that God and Wikipedia intended, $477. Great, we have a calculate monthly payment function. But of course, we don't want Bob to have to come into the script and edit the code every time he wants to calculate a new monthly payment. What we need is a GUI. Now, here's another question for you guys. How many of you have tried to build a UI using Google Apps Script, using UI app? OK, a few people. It's pretty difficult, because you have to construct your entire UI and code, which is sometimes complicated and painful which is why today we're happy to announce the AppScript GUI Builder. This is a drag-and-drop GUI Builder. I'm sure you're familiar with the type. 
you can create a UI in it, use it for map script, and this is live today. You can go turn it on right now. It's in the file menu. We'll show it to you in a minute. So, so what can the GUI builder do for you? Well, of course, it can let you build a user interface easily. It can also let you decorate it later. And this is really important. You can build a functional interface, make it work, and then worry about styling it after the fact. You can script it as usual, and I'm going to go into that in detail in a moment. And finally, as with everything in Google Apps Script, you can deploy it fast. We barely, we barely uh, have the word deploy in our dictionary. One-click deployment is what we're all about. The GUI builder helps you reduce development time because you can iterate quickly on the UI as you're building the script. It also reduces code size because you can separate out the UI and the styling from business logic. And in fact, you don't even need to have explicit code for your, for your UI. It just works. And finally, it actually helps you with the correctness of your code because the builder helps you avoid common UI app pitfalls. You can't put widgets and panels that don't support them. You can't set values that aren't allowed. The builder prevents common UI app errors. And if it works in the builder, it will work in UI app. Building a GUI should be fast and intuitive because you guys are fo focused on application design, not on website design. You don't want to de deal with CSS quirks. You don't want to deal with setting you know, values browser by browser. So we do that for you. The GUI is real WYSIWYG down to browser quirks, like I just said. On the left is a UI from the builder showing in Firefox. On the right is the same UI showing in Chrome. Notice that there are slight differences. These are done by the browser so that it looks native to each browser and each OS. However, the functionality will be the same. Most importantly, what you see in the builder is what you will see in that browser. So if you open this, this same UI in Chrome, you will see the app as it will show when running Chrome. If you open it in Firefox, you will see it as it shows if run in Firefox. I have not mentioned Internet Explorer because we support all modern standards compliant browsers. We do have rudimentary Internet Explorer support, and it, more should be coming, but it works right now very well in Firefox and Chrome. OK, so how do you build a UI? You can use draw or drag to create widgets. Dragging is when you just click on the palette, drag a widget right off. Drawing is when you select an item on the palette, carefully place and draw like you were drawing in a paint program. And these are the same widgets as in UI app, so you should be immediately familiar with them. Not all the UI app widgets are available. You can expect the rest of them to come shortly and more widgets to be added both to the builder and UI app in the days to come. You can lay out or group widgets using panels. Nested panels can create complex effects, and flow panels, like flow panel or vertical panel, et cetera, can let you create resolution independence using both flow panels and percentage sizing so that your UI show up correctly on everything from mobile devices to large screens. You can even try different resolutions without resizing your browser, because as we'll see in a moment, there's an application window inside the builder that can be independently resized. And a lot more of this is coming, too. In future versions in the near future, you can expect things like snap to grid, dragging guidelines as you drag near something. All that is on its way. Each widget in the builder exposes only the properties that it supports, so you can focus on exactly what you need, and also so that you can't set a value that won't make any sense. Everything is checked as you type. Every value is validated, and you get immediate feedback you see, the, you see the effect in the builder as you type it, and if it can't be applied to that property, to that widget, it won't be saved. So if it works in the builder, it will work in your app. And finally, you can add behaviors, event handlers, directly from the builder, and we'll see an example of that right now. So here's the builder. We load it from the file menu. That menu item is live today. And here it is, a floating application window. On the right side is a properties bar, editable properties. On the left side is a, a widget palette with more widgets to come. Let's start building Bob's mortgage calculator. Just the simple building blocks. A flow panel to hold the emails as they come in. An absolute panel for the calculator, top right area. And a label at the bottom to hold the text of the currently selected email. Once we've dropped items on the, on the application, we can edit them, either by dragging them or resizing them, as so. or by using the properties bar to edit the currently selected widget or widgets. Changing the text, everything is changed live. Change the color. If you, can't, if, you, if you edit it here, you'll see it's real immediately. So how are we going to interact with this UI in code? If we want to get a reference to an element in the UI, we need to use its ID property. So let's set some IDs. The top left panel, well, that's the emails panel. 
the top right panel, well, that's the calculator. Great, so now we have references that we can use in code. Let's actually start building the calculator. We'll need a calculate button, rip it off, place it where we like it. We'll give it an ID, some text. Great, and of course some behavior. The GUI builder is aware of your script, so all the functions in your script are available to set as event handlers right there in the builder. When you click on calculate, the calclick function will now be called. Oh, and we need a button at the bottom for that reply with quote. Same thing, replace it, resize it, give it an ID, give it some text, wait for the video to catch up with me. Generate reply with quote, and so on. Okay, so let's go back to that calculator at the top and continue building that. We'll need some labels for the fields. And notice as these are drawn that the component tree on the top right is showing you the hierarchy, the panel-based hierarchy of your UI. You can actually select things and edit them directly from that tree. We need a label for the result. We'll put a dollar sign in there so that it looks nice when there's nothing showing yet. and some text boxes to hold the actual fields. Now, as I said before, the way you get a reference to an element in the UI is through its ID. So we're gonna set the IDs to text amount, text rate, and text years. And of course, we'll set the labels to match. This next part is really interesting. Each email that came in showed its subject, its from and its subject on its own row. What we're going to do now is build a single email row, which we can use as a template to stamp out multiple copies of the same piece of the UI. So here we put a flow panel, we call it row, and we're gonna copy that over and over in, in, in the app. We set some sizing on it, 100% width, get rid of its border. And now let's drop some labels on it, a label for from and a label for subject. And you can see that the interaction with these widgets is pretty natural. You size them or you edit them as you'd expect in any other application. A label for subject. Uh, notice the blue boxes. They go, the blue box shows where the widget will go when you let go of it. So if you're dragging it or resizing it, that's where it will end up. When you're doing this on an absolute panel, it's not the most obvious thing because it's directly behind what you're dragging, but when you're working on a flow panel, it's actually really helpful to see the entire UI reflowing as you're dragging. We have from, we have subject. Great. 100% width. And now let's just set some styling. From should be bold. And let's drag all the widgets that we want to be the same color. Select them all with control. Set a nice color. And this is the decorate it later part that I mentioned. Once we've built the UI, we can worry about the way it looks. Nice yellow backgrounds. A different color for, for the label at the bottom. And there it is, Bob's calculator app, exactly as we showed it before. So we can build a UI. What can we do with it in script? The first thing we need to do with a builder component, and here I'm going to define a term, we call the UI you just built a component. The first thing you can do is load it in with a new function, UI app load component. Everything you do in the builder has 100% compatibility with UI app code, and components act exactly as if you had typed in the code to create them. Here's how you show the app, show the UI you just created as, a, as its own web page. This is standard if you've ever used UI app or if you look at our existing UI app code, you write a do get function. You create an application, var app equals UI app dot create application. You add to it the loaded component, and this is the only new part, app dot load component. And you return the app. This will show that UI that you just show, that you just created as its own web page. But we can do more than that. Builder components can be edited in, apparently. Builder components can be edited in something, in code. Here we're loading a component from the GUI. We're grabbing a single widget from it. So we're using the, the IDs that I mentioned, app.getElementById, and grabbing out button one. And then we're changing the text. 
So we're editing the, builder, the UI from the builder. It's not static. You can use it just as if you had created the code yourself. You can also add new UI app widgets inside of a builder component. So here, we're loading a component, grabbing out panel one from it, again, same way as before, using its ID to get a reference to it, and then adding a new button inside. And this button is completely a UI app. This is not from the builder. So UI app and the builder can totally interact. You can even pull out parts of a component. Here, we're loading a component, grabbing a panel again, an inner panel, not the entire component, and only adding part of the component to the app. The only part that will show now in the app is that inner panel, and I'll show you an example of this in a moment actually working. Finally, you can add the same component to the app multiple times. This is how we achieve using that row as a template over and over again. Now, of course, there's a problem, because every element in a UI app must have a unique ID, and these IDs are coming from the builder. So you can use the optional prefix function, prefix um, property, to set a prefix for each version that you load in. No longer will there be a calculate button. There will be a one calculate and a two calculate. And this is how we can distinguish them in code. Great. So now we've built the UI for Bob's mortgage calculator. How can we get this application out to the world? How can we deploy it? So there are a couple different ways that code from Google Apps Script can be deployed. The first is as an add-in, either to a spreadsheet or more recently to a Google site with more integrations coming. In a spreadsheet, you can use it as a custom function or as a dialog with its own user interface that might be raised from an integrated user menu. And the key here is, when you're publishing a Google Apps Script as an add-in, it runs as the user at the keyboard. What does that mean? It means that when you load an ad a spreadsheet that has an add-in, you, the guy running the spreadsheet, are the user who's being referenced by the script. So if it's referencing contacts or calendar, it's referencing your contacts and your calendar. In contrast, the other way to publish a Google Apps Script piece of code is as an app on its own with its own URL and its own user interface, not inside of an existing app. In that case, it executes as the publisher. And this is ideal for things that want to be run as role accounts. So if, for example, you build an HR-based system, you can always run it as HR at your domain. Let's see what it looks like to do a custom function. Well, we created that calculate monthly payment function, and we debugged it, so it should work. And all we need to do to make it work is go to a spreadsheet, type equals calculate monthly payment, and a couple of parameters, and bang, it works. No deployment. If it's a visible function in your script, visible just means it doesn't end with an underscore so that you can hide implementation details. But if it's a visible function in your script, then you can just use it in a spreadsheet immediately. You can return a single value to overwrite that cell, or an array or a double array to overwrite a range. A slightly more complex, but still pretty easy integration is to use a custom dialog raised from a custom menu. The special on open function lets you add menus to a spreadsheet as it's created, as it's opened. Pretty easy code, spreadsheet app, get active spreadsheet, add a menu mortgage with a submenu of calculator that calls a function show calc. Let's see how that works. Someone clicks on mortgage, get calculator. Hey, there is the same little calculator app that was in the top right corner of Bob's application. And just like I promised, this is an example of showing, of showing just part of something from the builder inside an app. So all we did was we added the component from the builder to a script, to an app, only showing the inner panel. So we loaded it, but only added an inner panel. And the calculator works exactly as we like without the email integration that we showed before. How do you distribute something like this? Well, there are two ways. You can publish it to the public script gallery. And pub this public script gallery is really public. It's accessible from any spreadsheet. And for safety reasons, you can only publish to the script gallery from a non-domain account, from a gmail.com account. This is important because we don't want you to accidentally leak your personal company enterprise assets into the public script gallery. In contrast, if you'd like to publish something to your domain, you can use the template gallery. That's local to your domain. And the entire spreadsheet gets saved with the script. So it's pretty nice if you have a spreadsheet that assumes a certain layout. I'm sorry, if you have a script that assumes a certain layout of your spreadsheet, you can publish it to, the domain, to your domain template gallery, and the entire spreadsheet gets put up there. And this helps you save um, your corporate assets from being leaked out. Here's what it looks like. You click, sorry, share, publish script. And then you get this publish your script dialog. You fill it out with the information you like. And bang, there it is in the public script gallery. The flow for the template gallery is fairly similar. OK, how about publishing a fully, a fully capable web app with its own user interface? Well, the word publish in this context means slight, something slightly different. Rather than showing the code, publishing the code, so that someone else could run, could run the app, 
We mean actually publishing the app as an executable that someone else could use at a URL directly. Here's the app. We'd like to just make this exist at some web page. So in the sharing menu, there's a publish a service uh, menu item. You can select how you want it to be run. You can have it only available to yourself for a personal script or maybe for something you're testing, to members of your domain, or to anybody, where anybody's either defined as any Google user or really anybody, any anonymous user on the internet. And here's the best part. As soon as you click Enable Service, that URL you see there is live. That is the entire deployment process of Google Apps Script. And you want to undeploy it, uncheck the box. That's all it takes. No XML, no manifest. I can't stress this enough. OK. So I'm going to hand this over to Drew now. Because although I've spoken a lot about how to build the UI, I haven't actually told you what to do with it. Well, Corey showed you how to build this nice, fancy facade for building this mortgage application. Unfortunately, he kind of hand waved his, uh, he kind of hand waved over what I would consider the difficult parts, the business logic. Um, and some of you may have guessed by the stuff that's in there is going, how on earth did they actually read the stuff out of the, out of the inbox? Well, I get to announce that we are uh, rolling out the Gmail service in the next couple of days, which will allow you to full access, you know, full fidelity access to the Gmail inbox. It's not through some IMAP thing or some of the other ways that uh, people have done this in the past. Um, so this, it, I was going to say, this gives us a great way to be able to do all sorts of stuff. Um, as far as the way the API works, if you've used Gmail, anybody here use Gmail? If you've used Gmail, you, you're, when you see the API, you're going to be like, oh, duh, that's just the way it's supposed to work. Um, and you can do all the normal things, compose, you can check uh, labels, all sorts of stuff. Um, in Gmail, just as in the, uh, in the interface, there are the main three things. There's threads, which contain messages, and those messages can be labeled. Uh, and they can be labeled multiple times. The interface to deal with labels is pretty straightforward. Uh, you can create them, you can delete them, and you can get them by either, either get all of them or get a specific one that you're looking for. Um, within the threads, uh, you can get threads either by your inbox, priority inbox. We even allow you to get it from your spam if you actually want to look at your spam. Uh, and you know, we provide convenience methods to get things like the number of unread messages in those threads. They can also be marked as important or unimportant uh, for like the priority inbox within Gmail. Uh, you can mark them as read or unread, and you can move them around uh, as well. This is my personal favorite one, because uh, I use this all the time. I use search for everything. Uh, and through the search interface is really the, the longer form version of being able to get to all the things I just talked about before. Uh, and in the case of going back to the mortgage app, this is how we're going to get the emails that we display in that upper left pane. Uh, just like Whatever you can put in that search box is the same thing that you can put as the argument to Gmail app.search, correct, right there. Um, and then iterate over the threads, maybe do some additional filtering or data munging if you want as you loop over them, and then return the messages back. Well, the other thing that the mortgage app did is that at the end of the day, it could send a quote to the person who originally sent the email asking for the quote. So also rolling out the next couple of days is access to Google Documents. Uh, this allows you to write them, edit them, create them, the whole nine yards. And of course, if you're going to work with a document, you need to do one of two things. You, either, you need a document to start with. Um, so you can either create a new one, you can give it a name, or you can get an ID from one and you open it by that. And the, way, the, 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 the IDs that we use here are, if you've, you know, when you've got a Google document open, it's got a long string of random looking text in the URL bar. That's what the ID is, and that's what you would pass in. Within a document, if you're familiar with the W3C DOM, it's different here. The, 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 DOM, the, the DOM for documents is a little different, but it will be very familiar to you. Uh, within the document, there's the body, there's paragraphs, headers, footers, list items, tables, all that. For right now, headers and footers are read-only. They will be read-write very soon. So in our case, what we wanted to do for the mortgage app is that we have this template document that's going to contain the relevant information for the mortgage that we're, uh, for the quote that we're going to send them. And so what we did is we made a template document, and we put in these placeholder fields right here. Uh, the start and end with percent, there's nothing magical about them. It's just something handy that we're going to use to do a little magic in a minute. Uh, we don't, so, yeah, uh, and Google Docs doesn't yet support fields, so we can't use that for field substitution. So, so we've got this template document. And then we're going to write a little JavaScript function. And what it does is it goes to the docs list and gets the 
file with the original ID of the template. Um, you could do this by name if you wanted to. Um, and then we make a copy of it, and then we get the ID of the document we just made a copy of. Using that, we use the document app to open it up. We get the, the body, content, uh, body content of the document, and we just do basic search and replace for all the items that we wanted to put in there. And then we return the document, and that'll become important in a minute, uh, a little bit later. Now, I'm gonna take a little bit of a, 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 little, a tangent and talk about something called blobs uh, for a reason that will become clear very shortly. First, what's a blob? It kind of looks like that funny looking fish. It's something ill-defined or amorphous. Um, some people may have the notion of a binary large object from a database. Please cast that from your mind. It reminds us all of bad things and we don't want to talk about them. Um, <laughs> We have a bunch of different sources and sinks of data within, Go uh, within Google Apps Script. And, you know, it might be you're unzipping something and you're putting it into your doc list, or you're going to query JDBC and then post that to some website, or do a file upload into JDBC or email attachment. To, I mean, you kind of get this Cartesian product of different ways to interact with things. And very quickly, this gets out of hand. And nobody wants to deal with any of this stuff. So, hence the blob. Anytime you're gonna deal with some massive data that's got a name, a type, and some measure of content to it, this allows us to treat all these things the same way, regardless of where they come from and regardless of where they're gonna be going to. Blobs are fairly simple things. They have a name, like I said. They have a content type, uh, which is like the, the RFC style MIME type. Uh, they have, and then they have content, either as bytes or as a string. You can treat them either way, depending upon what you wanna do with them. Um, the idea with a blob is that for a lot of times you're dealing with data, you don't necessarily care about the specific format of the data that's in there. Say you get a JPEG image from someplace. You know, most people aren't gonna go parsing through the thing. They just wanna ship it off to something else. But there's some cases where like if you've got an RSS feed from someplace, you wanna be able to shuffle through the thing to parse it apart. Um, and in some cases, depending upon what you're doing in your scripts, you may actually in fact wanna create a blob from scratch from code. So, the question is, okay, we've got these ideas of a blobs, what can we do with them? Well, say we'll get a bunch of blobs from the attachments of this particular sites, app, sites page that we've got. And then we've got a URL fetch that we're gonna do to go fetch an image from someplace. And I've got an image in my docs list that I wanna include too. And then, using the new zip functionality that we've added to the utilities, uh, the utilities interface, which we also have an unzip, which works the expected way. We can now zip all these different things, regardless of where they came from, and produce a zip blob named files.zip. And then from there, we can take all that, and then mail is all as an attachment to bob at example.com, and this all just works. Uh, one of our coworkers that we were talking with, and we, she started using it and had mentioned, it's almost like magic once you use these things, and yeah, it is kind of cool. So why am I talking about blobs at all for all this? Spreadsheets and documents are blobs also in this whole thing. Um, and one of the things we need to do if we're gonna mail these things around, depending upon who gets them, is we might need to convert them in some fashion to some form that they can actually use, because maybe they don't want a link. So Google Docs can convert automatically to PDF. Um, a lot of other types, we can convert those to PDF too, things that generally would have some form of expected PDF form that you would expect. Um, we can also convert between image formats for the images that we've, uh, for the image formats that are listed there. And we also have a whole bunch of other ideas of conversions we'd like to be able to do. Um, some things would be like, take an image, crop it, rotate it. You could do that as a conversion. Or say, get the second uh, page in a spreadsheet, get this data range out of it, and convert that to a PDF or an image or something else that you could do. Um, some of the more cooler things we were thinking of is that Google's got some really cool stuff that can do like speech recognition and stuff. So maybe you could convert a WAV file to a Google Doc. Um, all sorts of crazy things that we can think of or doing OCR automatically on the fly from an image. So we've got, we get, there's a lot more things that we want to do. So watch this space. So how do we actually do the conversion? Fortunately, it's actually a pretty simple matter from code. You just say get as and here's the content type that I want. So in this particular case, I've got a photo in my docs list, and I want it as a, it's a JPEG as it starts off, and I want it as a PNG. Just say, get as, image PNG, and it's that simple. Or if I've got my attachments before, 
I can arrays in JavaScript have a bunch of couple of nifty methods that, you know, I kind of forget that they're there. Uh, but there's a neat one called map, which allows me to take an anonymous function and say, for each of the items that are in those attachments, get them all as application PDF. Uh, the map function is very similar to, uh, in, uh, in Python, has a map function that's very similar in schemes, it's the same thing. Uh, in the Java Guava libraries, it's iterables.transform. It shows up as, it, it shows up as it's a common thing where it's basically apply this function to every element in the original array and return me an array of those results. Or to spell it out a little bit more clearly, you have Sites app, you get the original list of attachments, you start off with an empty array of PDFs, and then for each of the blobs, in, for each of the blobs that were in the, the blobs array, is you push a converted one uh, from the blobs array. Or going back to the mortgage example, we had that create document uh, function before, and it returned the document that it had produced. So we're gonna take that document, and then we're gonna take the message also that we had from Gmail that we originally started with, and we're gonna reply to it, and then we're gonna take the document that we got, that we had created, we're gonna convert it to PDF and attach it to that reply, and it's gonna send off. And then we're gonna mark the message as read so that therefore when we go back to that UI, we don't see it anymore because it only looks for things that were unread. So starting with this, you know, we've already got the email selected. He's gonna punch in the, uh, the $240,000, 4%, 25 years, come up with this payment of 1266.81, and he's gonna generate the reply. He goes over to, e to check his email, and sure enough, there's the email. And if you look at the attachments, there it is, the PDF file we made, and then opening up as a PDF, because Chrome nicely supports PDF files. So we've done a bunch of boring data entry apps, but AppScript doesn't always have to be that boring. Um, it can look really snappy and snazzy. And here to talk about that is James. Well, hello, everybody. I guess we're a little early today. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, I'm really, really excited to be here talking to you all today here at Google I.O. And, um, and I wanted to show you some of the things that you could do with that new uh, GUI editor and, and how we're going to uh, use that. So... Um, you know, as a, as a developer that's always on the go, you know, I'm hopping from computer to computer, one of the things I really appreciate about Google Script is that it's a 100% web environment. So while I'm developing for the web, I can do that on the web. When Google Script put uh, script gadgets into sites, we, as developers, we gained a lot of ability to be able to engage the viewers in a completely new way that's very interactive. So now we can do things like hover over uh, pop-up menus and, and uh, informational pieces. And this also works great for the educational setting for teachers to better engage students with the with, uh, information they want to get out to them. Um, I wanted to show you an app that we built. Uh, it's, uh, it's called Andy. And uh, Andy's got a few tasks he want to, wants to perform to you today. And what we have here is we have a control panel that's a set of buttons up, in the, up at the top of the screen that move Andy. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna head on over to the calendar app and we're going to retrieve a list of, of Andy's events for the day. And we can format those in a way that matches our, our theme for the application. Now Andy can see that he's got some work that he needs to get done today, so he's gonna go up and do a little writing in docs. So um, here we have another list of Andy's docs pulled from a specific folder in his Google Documents. And let's go ahead and create a document so we can get a little work done here. Now you see that automatically updates uh, the list there. Well, it's time for Andy to get social. So let's go ahead and we're, in order to do that, we're going to have to connect to a service that's outside Google Script. So here we see we're pulling in um, the latest news and a buzz from, from Andy's friends using the URL um, fetch app. So say thank you, Andy. So these are the different scripts we used. So what I want to do next is I want to show you how we go about designing a, a UI like, like this and, um, sorry, I have to stay close to the mic, um, and how we make Andy move. So 
the, what we, what, when you're building an app in the, in the UI app, it's kind of like painting a, a picture. You add some gesso and some color, and pretty soon you have mountains and trees and airplanes and things like that. In order to get depth of field in a painting, you paint over the top of other things, and that, that gives you that depth. Well, in the UI app, when we add things to, to the UI app, they add in the order that they were placed on the page. So they stack to the, to the lowest point. Um, here, I, I, we've added a couple of grids to the page that have stacked. And what we can do next is we can add in, um, and you'll be able to do this in the, in, obviously in the, UI, in the GUI editor as well. So we can add elements to each cell within a grid and create basically a traditional table or, or div type uh, web page like you, you would traditionally do. Um, What we'd like to do now is, is I'd like to show you a little bit about how you can use CSS to position objects on, on the page. And we use the position fixed um, to set items above, other, or above the page so that we can move them. The problem with that is when we start applying directly in our code, when we start applying uh, attributes, you have to write an attribute for every single widget that you want to use. And that gets really messy. So you can do that by using a function that will cycle through. You create the, the CSS just as you normally would um, write CSS in an HTML page. And you, you use a function to apply that to whatever widget you happen to want. So here we have a function that will apply um, a given element there. So to make Andy move, what we're going to do first is we're going to set the we're going to set some x, y coordinates in the script properties. That way we can access that property from anywhere in the script by just calling it by, say, git property x. Uh, once we've set those positions, then we can give Andy a starting position by using, like I had said before, we use a, uh, the function, or a, a, we set a CSS element, the at Andy element, and give him a position. Then we can create the at Andy image and apply the CSS and then he'll be in his starting position. To make him move, we're gonna need a couple of buttons. So we will, uh, first we're going to create the button, then we're gonna attach a click handler to it that's gonna fire off the function move, and we're going to set the ID of each button to be the direction that it's going to press. Here's the move function. And the first thing we, we do in the move function is we're going to get where Andy's currently at by using the get property. We're gonna set X and Y. And then we're going to run through a series of if statements where we're going to check the E parameter source to find out which button was pressed. Uh, and we're also going to use an additional if that if Andy happens to be at the side or the top or the bottom that he's going to stop and it's just going to return the act directly. Once we know which button's been pressed, this is just a simple matter of incrementing or, or decrementing the, the property. And then we'll apply, the, CS, or we'll apply the, the CSS like we did before when we set his original start position. And that's okay. it. <laughs> so let me recap. Once again, this is Bob. And now Bob is really happy because not only is he helping people, he's not wasting any time doing it. Today we built Bob's mortgage calculator using the brand new GUI builder that, like I said, is available today. We, we were able to build a full app as well as a spreadsheet calculator add-in. And we deployed it as a service into the gallery. We also showed you the new Gmail service, which is launching in the next day or two, which is just as simple as using Gmail itself. And finally, we showed you the document service, which finally has an API for scripting Google Documents. I keep saying finally, but we have a lot more actually because we showed you blobs. Don't overthink it, it will just work. Take objects, attachments from sites, attachments from Gmail, post them directly to your doc list. Don't worry about the type of the object, it will just work. And conversions, some simple cases like Google Document to PDF were covered today. Stay tuned for more and interesting ones. Finally, James was kind enough to show us Andy app and some expert tips on how to use Google Apps Script to do more than just boring data entry. So at this point, we'd like to take questions. Uh, Drew, James, and I uh, will answer any questions you have about what we showed you today.
They don't want to hear the question. We can hear you. Uh, the question I have about this new Gmail access service, which sounds really exciting, is will this allow me, uh, it wasn't clear to me how the user is authenticated. You say this actually uses the context. You know, like for example, if I'm trying to access the context of a user, do we have to use OAuth or something else like that to yeah, authenticate I mean, the user? If, if you've used like the contact, uh, the contact app interface or uh, the, con the calendar app, you know how you get the auth screen when you run it the first time? Yes. It's the same kind totally of thing. Totally the same thing for that. Exactly the same thing. Yeah, we do the OAuth for you. So all you need to do is click OK, I want to authorize this, and it will work. OK. So it sounds like it's a dramatic simplification in terms of setting that up for us. Is that Hope so. That was the idea. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much for your work on this. Hi. Uh, do you have any plans to include search as one of the services? Um, I don't think we have anything to say about that now. I, I don't think anyone's currently working on that, but uh, can't ever rule anything out in the future. OK. You can always use existing APIs. So for example, any kind of existing REST-based API can be hit through URL fetch. Uh, I can't remember from the slide about the Gmail. Does it access as well the contact and the group in the contact? Like if you say you want to do a mailing you know, to a group in your contact, can you do that? Or um, you can access contacts through the existing contacts app. So Gmail, the new Gmail app doesn't support that because we already have that support, but it's there. Okay, but you can't, yeah, like if you do like the example you had with the document where you send to people, you know, where you replace Phil, let's say you have a group in your contact or in the contact of the people who are going to use the script or the app, and they want to use that template in, your, in their doc to send the same email with the PDF attached to a group of people replacing just the field. You know, oh, I mean, if you have like a, OK, so like you, a you have a context yeah. group in your contacts yeah, that you, you want to be able group, to, you want to. Yeah, within the, context, uh, within the contacts app, there's actually a way to say, get me the, the contact group, get me this particular contact group, and then get the, emails out of, the email okay, addresses out of there. Okay, okay. So from there, yeah, you have the list of emails, and then you just do the message.reply like we did before, just with a list, uh, with an array of uh, email addresses instead of this, this, the, the lone one. So I saw the search in Gmail. Is there also? I didn't see one in, in Docs. Can I search for? Is there a, a search function inside of the Documents app? Yeah, it's called Find. <laughs> Stocklist.find. It's there. We actually showed it in one of the slides. Oh, I missed it. Sorry. There. I'm sorry. Are you asking about in the Docs list or in the new Document app? Yeah, the new Document. I guess if, if you have Docs list, you can find by. I didn't think about that. So, so uh, you said document open by ID, basically, right? Yeah, yeah it was document open by ID. Yeah, if you're going through the docs list, you can search by so name. search docs list, right. Hi. Um, the document creation and updating features that you were just showing, mm -hmm. uh, is there an API doing the same thing? Or do you plan to do this? I don't think I understand the question. I'm sorry. Because here we are using uh, uh, Google Script to create a document yes. and to uh, add some custom Oh, yeah, yeah to do data. the search replace, yes. But on, on um, uh, GData API for external application, we can't do this. So is there a plan to add the possibility to create and update documents from an external uh, application? Uh, we don't know. We're yeah. not on that team. Yeah, I, we're, we're just providing the glue <laughs> okay. as far as that goes. Yeah, the, uh, the docs people would be a better people to ask about that. OK, thank you. Hi, uh, I understand now we can uh, add an image to a Google spreadsheet. Uh, in, in general, you mean? In uh, yes. uh, yeah. is, is it possible to assess the image using Google Apps Script? Um, I don't believe it's currently possible. Uh, you know, we, we try to catch up with spreadsheet features as they come in, so uh, we, will probably, we will probably add that as, as we go on. I do not think that's currently possible. I don't remember seeing it in the API just yet, Thank but you. we can look into it. Okay. Are there any more questions? Going once, going twice. Okay, thank you everyone very much.